there are roughly 2.2 billion Christians in the world today, right now. There are roughly 41,000 denominations in the world. And when I say denominations, I mean all the different denominations. Even the denominations that say that they're non-denominational, I count those as denominations. They're just denominations without names. There are, there are Lutherans, there are LCMS, there are uh, NALC, the, there are WELS, there are basically any combination of L's and C's and throw a couple letters in there, right? We are the ELCA, you can have all kinds of fun with uh, letters and an acronyms, but, but even inside the ELCA, there is all kinds of diversity. We are, we are very well the middle of the road, which means we are a large umbrella and we have within our midst a lot of different people. There is probably a congregation out there that thinks that we are goofy for using drums and guitars. And that congregation probably uses only accordions. And that's all right. That's good. That's a fine way. There's many different ways, and there's all these different denominations, and there's 2.2 billion different Christians. And so when Jesus says, so that they may be one as we are one, i got to wonder why he would lift that up, because it seems to me that, that that is not the case. And in fact, it's never really even been the case. While Jesus was around, there was discussion of, hey, who is the greatest among us, they would ask Jesus. And even as he ascended into heaven, Peter and Paul are notorious for having headbutt each other over what is supposed to be and not be a Christian. Are are you allowed to be a Christian if you're like this? Or do you have to do this? And what about the Greeks? And, And what about slaves and women and all these other different things? Are those Christians? Can they be Christians? Even Paul himself, when he was laying down the line, he was saying, hey, this is what a Christian community looks like. They didn't understand. He wrote a letter after he he had visited a region called Corinth, and he wrote a letter to the Corinthians there, and they're still having problems. That's why there's a Corinthians too. Because from the very beginning, they didn't understand, and they had division. There had to be two letters. You had to send them down and tell them, hey. And it didn't stop there. After Paul was, was gone and the church was well on its way, there rose another controversy about who Jesus was and, and really what was the nature of his being. It was called the, the Arian controversy. And, 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 and it pit this guy, Arian, against Athanasian. And they had to write down in words, creeds, what we believe. Because it wasn't very clear what we actually believe. So the very first creed was the Athanasian creed. We say this one once a year on uh, Holy Trinity Sunday. It's really long. It, you may remember it. If you don't, just wait a couple weeks. It'll come back around. <laughs> <laughs> and we only say it once because it is so long, but it is so important to know what is we believe so that we can all at least have this one thought, this one idea of what is right and what is wrong. Well, he flashed forward a few hundred years, about 1054 or so, and that creed wanted to be changed. The, the, one of the, the bishops... At that time, the Bishop of Rome, we call him the Pope now, wanted to change just a little word, just one word. And and that ended up with a great schism. So that's how we got the Greek Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholics followed the one bishop in Rome and the other ones followed the other bishop in Constantinople. That was the big split. And then 500 years after that, there was another guy, some upstart, and he pulled out his cell phone and he Twittered all kinds, like 95 different things, put them on his Facebook page really big so everybody could say, hey, you know, there's a problem here. And that started it. That was the Protestant Reformation. And that, that started all the big downward spiral because what happened there? He, he got kicked out of the church and he said, well, I'll go down the road and start my own church. And he did, the Lutheran church. Now, okay, if you know your church history, he didn't want to start his own church. But, but there it is, Pandora's box is open. And, and, and after that, everybody who didn't like what was going on started their own church. They went from, from one idea to the next. And if they didn't like what was going on, they just went down the road and started their own church. And we still do it today. Except maybe we don't even do it with worship, with, uh, with theology today. We do it with worship styles. Well, I, I only like worshiping where we don't sing. Oh, no, I only like worshiping where we sing, but, but you can't use instruments. Now, I like all the instruments, all of them, except for drums. That's not acceptable. Jesus didn't like drums, I guess. Oh, but we do this. We do this all the time. Hey, you know what? I like preaching styles. I like it when the, when the preacher runs back and forth and says, hallelujah. Can I get an amen? amen? Hey, no, I like pastors who stay put and talk about the Bible only. Well, okay, well, we do that, right? Hey, there are, there are congregations. I am not joking, y'all. There are congregations who get up in arms and no joke split over something like carpet or wall hangings 
on windows. Jesus only liked Venetian blinds. No, 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 no. Jesus only liked curtains, you see. And if you didn't have curtains, then it's curtains for you. <laughs> you think I'm joking. I am not joking. I know of a story of a congregation that split over window treatment. Wow. But, but look, we all do that because we are all sinful bumpkins. That is the gist of it. That is the quick of it. That we decide what we like and we get so lost in the glitter that we forgot this gold bar. We worry too much about all the pretty and we forgot about the perfection. My, uh, my wife and I, we go out to eat. When we were first dating, we were just married. She used, to, she used to hate going out to dinner with me. Because every time we went out to dinner, I always had a problem with the dinner. You see, uh, once upon a time, I ran a, a fine uh, establishment, a, a fine cafe, and I would teach my, my, my staff, my servers, how to, how to engage with uh, the guests, and I would teach my chefs how to present the food, and everything had to be just right. This is fine dining. Fine dining is fine because it has a level of perfection of excellence that must be achieved, otherwise, just go to McDonald's. So whenever we go to eat, whenever we go to, I'd always have a problem. Oh, he's, he's not holding my wine glass properly. He didn't even know how to open a bottle of wine. What is, what is all this, this parsley on my plate for? God help this guy who put parsley on my plate. I have cursed him. <laughs> I have cursed him so many times. And my wife, my wife, for, her, for her, all her patience in the world, <laughs> she would go to dinner with me still. And I am the worst. I really, truly am. I need to be forgiven for this because... Because, y'all, look, I would, I would take the bill, and I would, I would give the tip, and then on the back, I would give him tips. <laughs> on back of the tip, right? Oh, you can do this. I am that guy, and that is, that is not the guy you want to be. No, it is not. It is a really bad way. And my wife eventually, she eventually said, look, just enjoy the meal, stupid. <laughs> How come we can't go out to eat without you always picking and nitpicking? Does it always have to be perfect? And, and you know what? You know what, I got so worked up and busy about what it was going wrong with the meal, I forgot to realize that there's this gorgeous woman who wants to spend time with me. That's why I'm at the meal. I'm not there so I can figure out who can open the bottle of wine the best. I'm there so I can spend time with this woman. I got all kinds of lost in the, in, in, in the glitz of the meal. I forgot the reason of the meal itself, which was to spend time in this love. And we do that too. We are all kinds of good at picking out what is wrong and what doesn't fit and what doesn't look right. And we put things into categories and, and all of a sudden everything has, you know, a better or a worse than or a second rate or something like this. And we do it, we do it to everything from, from, from cereals to cell phones to people. Sexism, racism, all of these things. Denominations aren't proof of our sin they're not proof of our holiness, they're proof of our sin. When we say, oh, okay, all of a sudden, uh, you can't worship with me because, you know, I worship like this and you worship like this, and, and, then, and then that doesn't work. When I say, hey, I'm better than you because of fill in the blank, no, 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 we, God made us all equal. We are all equal. There is no separation between us and any other person. But we love to do that, put ourselves on pedestals. Well, that guy stinks, literally smells. I must be better than him. You're better than him because you have a shower? But we do it. You do it. I know you do it because I do it. Because we all fall into that trap. In fact, right now, right now, literally right now, all over this nation, all over this world, there are good people. Good, truly good people who are worshiping in churches, Worshiping an awesome God. And if we, were to ask, if we were to ask those people, hey, would you, would you come and worship with, with us somewhere else? Would you go and do this at another congregation? They would say, no, I could never do that. You see, because this is my church, or, or I believe like this. Good people who believe that Jesus only talks to them and has decided that everybody else literally is going to hell. I don't want to... I don't wanna, diminish the differences between the denominations. There, there are some differences there. That they exist for a reason, usually not because of window treatments. It's usually because of things that we find really important and big, theological things, stuff like that. 
I don't want to say that those things don't matter. I don't want to diminish them. But what I do want you to grasp is that our God is so much bigger than all of those little things that separate us. But we are all too happy to let them separate us so that they can go be them over there and we can all be the saved and the happy over here. And that is not how our God works. So when Jesus says, let them be one, I want you to hear that that's not a goal. That's not something we can achieve. That's not a hope maybe for the future when Jesus comes again. Maybe then we can be one. Because it's never been the case that we're all under one umbrella in the sense of denominations, but we have always been under one umbrella as the family of God, the body of Christ. We've all been adopted into the one body of Christ. Every last one of us have gone through these waters. And it doesn't matter from whence you came. The Baptists have a very different understanding than the Catholics about what happens with these waters. But we all pass through them. And whether or not you think it is just a, a nice way of getting wet in front of people, because that's what you like to do on a Sunday, or whether it is that this is something that God is doing to you because that's what you like to do on a Sunday, we all pass through these waters. These are the waters that make us one. It's not because we all sing the same songs. It's not because we all have the same prayers. It's not because we all believe the same thoughts and we're all the same. In fact, we're all very, very, very different. The thing that makes us one is the God above us is bigger, more powerful, more loving and willing to look past all of those things that would separate us that we might use to separate ourselves. All 41,000 of the different reasons that we've separated ourselves are just other names for the big family that is the body of Christ. This is not some hollow act. This is not just getting wet. This isn't just because I think babies should be wet. This is because something special is happening there. It's not just a rite of passage. Oh, we should, we should do this. It's not a, an insurance plan in case maybe you die. You'll have that in your back pocket to pull out and show Jesus like it's a get out of free jail card. This is not a guarantee. This is not a guarantee of salvation. This opens the door. You can walk through it. I will guarantee you, as you walk through it, you will walk back out. Which is why every Sunday we come back to this place. To this place that we are protected, gathered, strengthened, and united. Because if we find ourselves alone and by ourselves, we will be ripped up just as quickly as the sheep outside of its fold in the midst of whatever evil demon, lion, tigers, and bears, oh my, that will come and rip us apart. In these waters, we get salvation, we get forgiveness, and we get adoption. It's the most beautiful gift that we're ever going to be given. It doesn't get any better than this. And today we're going to welcome two people into the body of Christ, into this congregation. That here they might start that relationship, and that might grow, and that might blossom, and that they might be for the world a beautiful gift that they might reflect the gift that they've been given here at this table out into the world for their entire life. When we separate ourselves into the different denominations, and we think somehow we've got it right. I want you to understand that it's not us who's right. God looks at those separations and he laughs. He says, your separations are proof of your sin. But I love you anyway. I'll forgive that. I'll cleanse you. You are mine. I own you. I called you. I claimed you at your baptism. 